These people want you to believe that they're doing you a favor by holding on to some resources for your children and grandchildren, maybe they aren't even born yet, which is absolutely ludicrous. Why would you trust somebody after you're dead? Why would you trust these people to manage what's rightfully yours or should be to make it available to your children and grandchildren, great grandchildren? That is so stupid, in my opinion. It's absolutely ridiculous. Anybody should just reject it straight out of hand. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here at CorbettReport.com. Today is the 2nd of April, 2019, and today we are honored to be joined on the line once again by a repeated CorbettReport.com guest. We are talking to Patrick Wood. He is an author and researcher. He is also the editor and uh, site operator of Technocracy.news, a valuable information resource that I'm sure listeners will have noticed I do reference from time to time because there's a lot of information about the very important topic of technocracy, which of course has been the central guiding point of our previous conversations with Patrick Wood. I'll put the link in to those previous conversations in case you haven't listened to them yet. I think those are some important conversations. And of course, if you have seen Why Big Oil Conquered the World, you will have seen Patrick Wood already. So uh, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us on the program once again. Although it would help if you unmuted. (laughs) I'm <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, for, I have a cough button and I just forgot to do that. I'm so sorry. Great I, to be with great to be with you, James. Thank you. I've been doing this for twelve years now and I still do that on occasion, so <laughs> you are forgiven. Um well today, unfortunately, we're talking about a very serious topic once again. We're talking about the subject of your latest book, Technocracy, the Hard Road to World Order, which I believe came out late last year. As I mentioned on the podcast quite recently, I have only just uh, finished reading it. Um, It is an important book. I do heartily recommend it, so we will direct people to that, and I'll put the link in so people can purchase their own copy of this book. But let's start by talking about the topic. I know you've explained this so many times, it must be so incredibly boring for you, but on the flip side of that coin, you must be very good at explaining it now. I know my audience already knows about technocracy, but I know there are new people joining the audience every single day who may not have heard of this word that is not part of the regular lingua uh, franca of, of discourse these days. So, can you explain to us in a nutshell, what is technocracy? I can. Technocracy was a a movement started back in the 1930s, primarily by scientists and engineers at Columbia University, not exclusively, but that's where they started. That was during the Great Depression, and they thought that capitalism and free enterprise was dead and on its last legs, and they took it upon themselves to create a new economic system that would step in where where capitalism and free enterprise left off. It was to be a resource-based economic system And it was to be controlled or, uh, let's say, accounted for by energy, not by money, not by a price-based economic system like we're familiar with today, but rather by energy. So how much energy did it take to make this shirt, for instance, or these eyeglasses or whatever? That would be the price that I would pay for for something, depending on the energy that went into it to make it. This resource-based economic system never caught on in the 30s and 40s like they'd hoped it would, was primarily really rejected by the end of the 30s and certainly into the 40s it was rejected. However, a lot of it, as principles, kind of made it into the New Deal and and several of the technocrats of that day ended up in the administration working on behalf of technocracy. But technocracy was resuscitated by Zbigniew Brzezinski around 1970 when he wrote his book, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. And I should go back and reiterate, too, that technocracy proposed a system of scientific uh, social engineering. That was a term they kind of came up with. What does that mean? It means nothing, because social engineering is not a science. You can't, you don't herd cats. You can't make a science out of it. You don't know which way they're going to run. But they felt like they could use their advanced science uh, methodology to make rules and constructs for all of society and somehow manage the whole process. I don't think that's ever going to happen, by the way, and I, I expect you probably don't either. But that's what they, that's what they had in mind. So Brzezinski brought back into 
uh, the um, you know the intellectual realm, this whole idea of technocracy, not coincidentally, by the way, he was working at Columbia University when he wrote that book. So my guess is there was a connection. Somehow he'd heard about technocracy in the halls of power at Columbia. So he started out writing this book and when I discovered technocracy, I went back and read it again just to see if it was talking about technocracy, you know, technotronic technocracy kind of sounds similar. And I found out it really did. So when Brzezinski teamed up with David Rockefeller, I think as a result of that book, Rockefeller saw it as an opportunity to, to grab resources around the world and the name of technocracy. Remember, it's a resource-based economic system. So they set out, they said, to create a new international economic order in 1973. That was their literature. Myself and Sutton didn't really understand what new meant back then. We just thought, well, they're reshuffling the chairs on the Titanic, you know, the, <laughs> the sun deck. But today, I, I realized when they said new, they really meant new. Technocracy was the only other economic system ever devised in the history of the world that could potentially replace capitalism and free enterprise. So the new international economic order, I think, was really technocracy relabeled to suit Rockefeller's interests. And I would say, I would dare to say he hijacked the ideology. I, you know, I, he wasn't a purist in that sense at all. The Rockefeller family never was, as you know. But it was a convenient way for him to use it to gain access to resources around the planet that he formerly could not touch because they were locked up in sovereign, you know, sovereign uh, entities and stuff like nations and so on around the world. But now the United Nations is promoting this whole idea. Give up your resources. Let us manage them as trustees. And we'll take care of all of you. You know, we'll we'll tell you what you can make and what you can eat and how much of those precious resources that you can consume. And I guess ostensibly, if 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 you don't like it, if what they tell you to do, tough. <laughs> you, just, you know, so that's kind of technocracy in a nutshell. We could call it neo technocracy today in a sense that it's a bastardized form. Uh, a little bit of original technocracy, but the markers are very clear. Sustainable development and technocracy are almost point for point identical. Resource-based economic system, energy is obviously at the center of it. You just think cap and trade, just think uh, AOC with, uh, you know, with uh, the, green, the Green New Deal. Uh, energy is always at the center of this. Smart grids, another thing. So, um, sustainable development today is the uh, the primary goal of the United Nations and everybody surrounding the United Nations is to launch sustainable development as a global economic system, replacing capitalism and free enterprise completely from the ground up. Not well, not from the ground up, but to destroy capitalism and free enterprise and replace it with sustainable development. That's right. And this uh, touches on a couple of topics that we have talked about specifically before. I'll point people to our conversation on resource-based economics. I'll also point people to my podcast on what is sustainable development, where we uh, uh, featured your your comments on that quite heavily. Um, incredibly important, and we'll get back to those subjects uh, shortly. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the title of this book, The Hard Road to World Order. Can you explain to people where that title comes from? Well, I can. I was back in the day, I was uh, privy to an academic by the name of Richard Gardner. He was an early member of the Trilateral Commission, an academic, and he wrote an article for um, Foreign Affairs magazine, which was the um, Council on Foreign Relations magazine, called The Hard Road to World Order. And it, it became kind of a a famous touchstone article over the years. People have referenced it, quoted quoted it and stuff for, for decades. And nobody ever really answered Richard Gardner, in my opinion, correctly. And after all these years and I'm looking at this, I ran across his article again. I went back and I read the whole thing. It's not very long. And, and I just thought to myself, this guy deserves an answer 
we, we deserve to have closure on what he said should happen. That's why that's that's partly why I chose the title. It's partly why I wrote the book, is to say, yep, this is this is what they said they were going to do, and this is exactly what they've done. Well, as you've pointed out, this is a globalist ideology. It's about creating a new world order based on a new economic system. And, uh, of course, part of that is reflected in the fact that technocracy is not necessarily, um, well, certainly is not only being promoted in the West. It is being promoted everywhere around the world. But perhaps most interestingly, and most, uh, most in a most more fully developed form at this moment in China, which may be surprising to some who think simply of China as communist China. Well, it's more like technocratic China. And this is something that um, definitely lines up with a lot of the research I've been doing on China over the last several years. And I note uh, a very interesting analysis on the benefits of technocracy in China that you recently posted up to technocracy.news. I hope people will click through to that and read the entire article. It's very interesting analysis that goes into some depth on this, but you do talk about it in the book as well. Tell us a little bit about the roots of technocracy in China and why the technocratic dream may, might be realized there first. Well, we have to go back to really understand it. We have to go back uh, to the mid 1970s when Jimmy Carter was president and uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was his uh, national security advisor. That was a period of time. That was the first um, uh, iteration, as you say, of, of, uh, trilateral commission control over the United States trade mechanism. It was a clean sweep when Jimmy Carter got elected. They were, it's like they were all members of the trilateral commission. It was incredible. Carter, Mondale, all the cabinet members except one at one point in time were members of the trilateral commission. It was like old home week, you know, for these people. And Brzezinski was the guy that picked Carter in the first place. He later wrote and admitted that and said he was very proud of it. But Brzezinski was the guy who brought China back onto the world stage economically in the 1976, in particular, when he met with Chairman Deng at the time. And all the initial uh, diplomatic things that had to be done to bring China back into the world global or the global stage economically, that's where China got its start. I will suggest very strongly that in that day, uh, Brzezinski and the rest of the trilateral crowd saw that because Rockefeller had a love affair with China, by the way, for for decades, going all the way back to the early 1900s. I would suggest very strongly that they implanted the seeds of technocracy way back then, because all of the engineers, all of the com companies that they sent over there to do the redevelopment work or the infrastructure work to build China up, they were all connected to the Trilateral Commission. This was incredible. I studied this, but I scratched my head and I studied this back then. <clears throat> you had, for instance, Bechtel Engineering, a private, the largest private engineering company in the world, based in San Francisco. Bechtel Engineering had accomplished 18 major infrastructure projects in China before it was even legal to be there. They should have been, I mean, really, they should have been arrested, in my opinion, for consorting with the enemy, but they never were. They never got touched. Nobody ever raised an eyebrow. But that's the sort of thing that you saw back then. So all the companies that raced over there to set up manufacturing firms and do these giant infrastructure projects, they were all the companies associated with the Trilateral Commission. So we see over a period of time that China morphed away from being a communist dictatorship. The trappings are still there. They morphed into a technocracy. The earliest reference I can find, third-party reference to that, was a Time Magazine article in, two, I think it was the year 2000, maybe 2001. Surprisingly so. It was called The Revenge of the Nerds, I think. It was a stupid title. But the, the article said China was a technocracy. That its Politburo had all been converted into advanced scientific degrees, not idiot, not uh, not just ideological people, but they were engineers and scientists of various kinds, and that they were applying the scientific methodology to engineering China, just like technocracy said back in the 1930s, and they were doing it nilly willy with with no constraint whatsoever. So essentially, 
all, all Brzezinski had to originally do was shake hands with one guy. There was no parliament. There was no pesky bureaucracy. There was no uh, rules that were at odds with what he wanted to do. So China took the baton, if you will, and they ran the race. And now they have fully converted into a classic technocracy. The global elite now recognizes this, James. People like Dr. Prag Khanna from Singapore, for instance. He openly talks about China as a technocracy. And this guy ought to know he's a technocrat. He wrote the book Technocracy in America. So if people like that, world-class global scholars are calling it a technocracy, it's good enough for me. I'll just rest my case there with it. They're not a, they're, they're not a communist dictatorship anymore like they were, say, 50 years ago. And now we're seeing the fruits of that technocratic uh, swath of Politburo um, people who have been brought in in things like, of course, the facial recognition camera networks that are being connected into the artificial intelligence, that are being connected into the social credit scores. All of this dystopian nightmare is coming to fruition in China, and we're watching it develop. And now, of course, China is exporting that technology, um, for example, to Venezuela and other places where they're bringing in the identity cards that are based on Chinese, the t Chinese technology. So it's all coming together in a, in a rather horrific way. And I want to quote specifically a, an address that uh, a Chinese president for life, emperor for life, Xi Jinping, made at the Belt and Road Forum in May 2017 that you quote in the book. He said, we should pursue the new vision of green development and a way of life and work that is green, low carbon, circular, and sustainable. Efforts should be made to strengthen cooperation in ecological and environmental protection and build a sound e ecosystem so as to realize the goals set by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We will set up a big data service platform on ecological and environmental protection. We, were, we propose the establishment of an international coalition for green development on the Belt and Road, and we will provide support to related countries in ad adapting to climate change. So, you know, if you're playing bingo, that's pretty much every single United Nations uh, buzzword all in one go there. Um, so let's tie this in. For people who quite don't quite understand how technocracy and sustainable development and climate change and all of this go together, how does this nexus in? Wow. Well, China said it all with the Belt and Road Initiative that they have right now. They're trying to uh, to kind of reestablish the trade routes between China and Europe. And that's not exactly the way that the old Silk Road was back in, in ancient history. But the idea is to create a supply chain between uh, Asia and Europe and really the rest of the world. By supply chain, I mean move the movement of goods and services um, across national barriers. This is what uh, this is what China is attempting to do right now is to create a global economic system that won't be based as much on nation states as it will city-states and functional areas of economic cooperation. The fact that they're trying to sequester resources is seen everywhere in, in the United Nations doctrine of sustainable development. China is fully in line with this. The problem is that citizens of the world, especially in our country, but in Europe, increasingly so in Europe, um, and some in India, don't want sustainable development in their nation. They don't want to accept an alternative economic system, so they're resisting it. The only way that they have a chance to force it into existence is to scare people with some type of a scare tactic that will drive them into the only solution that's being offered, which is sustainable development. That driving factor is global warming. This is the fear-mongering uh, boogeyman that they present to say, oh my gosh, the world is going to come to an end in 12 years if we don't take drastic action today. That's what the Green New Deal was all about. We got 12 years to sort it out, folks, or we're all dead. So you better get busy and you better you know, use the political power you got here to drive us into sustainable development. If they didn't have global warming as that scaremongering factor, they would be nowhere today, James, absolutely nowhere. 
And they know it. That's why they continue to play the same card over and over and over again. They have no other playbook. Let's tie this into that new economic international order, international economic order, whatever it is that the uh, trilaterals were talking about decades ago and that is coming to view with this neo-technocracy. And let's talk about the resource-based economic system as opposed to the price-based system that we have today in relatively free markets, of course, not quite uh, free, but at least freer than um, than the technocratic vision. What is the resource-based economic system, and how does energy and energy supply and energy production play into that? Well, traditionally, what, what I think probably what you and I believe intuitively is that a price-based economic system lets the market work out issues, whatever it might be, resource, resource scarcity or abundance, um, t- technology and so on, that the market is able to moderate itself if you just leave it alone. If resource becomes scarce, the price is going to go up, people won't buy as much, it conserves the resource and the cycle goes on. These people don't accept that premise. They say that that's never worked and it's never going to work. And what they want to do is manage those resources directly. So when original technocracy was was thought out at Columbia University, they saw all of the major resources of the world, whether it be mining, timber, oil, and so on, all those types of resources, water, they were very big on water too, by the way. They saw all those resources as something that needed to be allocated to the people. The way that they were going to allocate those to the people was to create an energy-based currency. They called it energy script where a forecast would be made for a period of time, like a month or a quarter, a forecast of how much energy could be produced during that period of time, simply divide that by the number of population that you have to serve, and just simply just give everybody the energy credits for that period of time. In turn, they could take that to a store and they could buy things that cost that much energy to go in. If you used up all your energy credits before the end of the period, you're out of luck. If you uh, had some left over at the end of the period, they simply expired. They didn't want anybody saving any money. So there was no possibility for you ever to get ahead. You, you just have to live at the instance of the technocracy, if you will. You'd receive your energy credits, like supposedly like clockwork, as every new forecast was made going down the road. And you'd have no inheritance. You'd have no private property built up. You'd, you'd have no ability to do anything, but as they said, well, you have lots of time for arts and crafts and, and music and whatever other things, you, you hobbies you might have. But this was crazy. Now, you've got to think about it. If you don't have the right to have any resources, okay, they don't let you have any resources and save them up, where are they going to go? Who's going who's gonna to have them? Who's going to control them? It's not you. And if all the people that technate over a period of time, send out all the resources, land and whatever other resources they have, you end up with zero, and the people end up with zero, and they end up with everything. That that was the plan. That was that was what they thought was the goal. They figured mankind is too selfish to manage the resources himself. He needs help. From, <laughs> I'm I'm here from the I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you, right? You need help and spending these resources wisely so we don't run out. And I, I'm i reminded that 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 Gru Harlan Brundtland in her book um, that led to Agenda 21 in 1992, the doctrine is called Our Common Future. The statement that was throughout her book is the whole purpose of sustainable development was to preserve the resources of the day for generations tomorrow you know, like future generations. So they have enough. We don't want to be selfish with our with our resources. We want to make sure that your children and grandchildren have something to enjoy when they're born, like later on. This reminds me of the old Popeye cartoon from years ago where Wimpy was the, the big, uh, you know, heavyset guy, loved to eat hamburgers, and he would always come up to Popeye and say, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll give you... Uh, two dollars next week for a hamburger today. <laughs> it's like, you know, he never gave any money back, but uh, you know, he had lots of hamburgers. 
These people want you to believe that they're doing you a favor by holding on to some resources for your children and grandchildren, maybe they aren't even born yet, which is absolutely ludicrous. Why would you trust somebody after you're dead? Why would you trust these people to manage what's rightfully yours or should be to make it available to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren? That is so stupid, in my opinion, it's absolutely ridiculous. Anybody should just reject it straight out of hand. But this is their thinking. They sell that to people, say, oh, well, aren't you glad? We're, ta- we're, we're doing the responsible thing for you because you're too selfish or ignorant or whatever to do it by yourself. And why should you set up an inheritance system for your progeny? We'll do it for you. And we'll just do it all together. We have bulk discount. We could get a bulk deal and do it for all of humanity at the same time. Isn't life great? Yeah, somehow, I I imagine if your uh, grandchildren happen to have the right last name, like Rockefeller or Warburg or Morgan or Rothschild or something like that, they'll be fine. But if they have the wrong last name... Just a little bit better off. Yes, just a little bit better off. That's right. Yeah. Well, Well, you know, the, the idea of property being under trust can be seen in principle by looking at the Gulf of Mexico and all of the oil fields down there. If you were BP and you wanted to drill a well out in the Gulf of Mexico, you go to the U.S. government who owns the rights to that and you apply for a permit. You can get a permit. You can pay big bucks to the government to get it, but you'll have a a lifetime permit perhaps to drill oil well in a certain location. But if you, let's say that you came across $50 million and you were thinking, I'll I'll go drill an oil well somewhere. I think I'll do it in the Gulf of Mexico. And you, James Corbett, comes to the U.S. to the U.S. government and says, "I'm putting in my application here for a spot down there to drill a, a well. I'm pretty sure I know where I could hit hit oil." They're going to look at you and they're going to say, "Are you kidding? Get out of here! We don't know you. Uh, we we know BP. We know Shell. We know Standard. The Standard name. We know the Rockefeller name. But we don't know you. Get the heck out of our face. That's the way it's going to be." It strikes me that uh, a lot of the ideas of the original technocracy movement back in the 1930s were insane, pie-in-the-sky things that couldn't have even been really imagined at that time that are now becoming technically possible. So the idea, for example, one of the, one of the core principles of the technocratic movement of the 30s was that everything was going to have to be um, scanned and databased and tracked and cataloged in real time. They were going to have databases of everyone and what they were buying and how much and well, where those resources were going, which again, back in the 1930s would have been utterly impossible. But today, with the Internet of Things, is becoming not only possible, but actually a reality. Another interesting thing uh, about this is that you're talking about the idea of the energy script, that the currency itself is going to relate, is going to be backed by energy, essentially, which, again, back in the 1930s was a ludicrous pie-in-the-sky idea that is now becoming not only possible, but actual in the form of cryptocurrencies. Uh, For example, um, I'm not sure the general technical understanding of my audience, but long story short, Bitcoin is a proof-of-work currency where you have to devote computer resources to solve a cryptographic puzzle in order to mine new Bitcoin. And back in the day, back in the beginnings of the uh, blockchain a decade ago, that was a relatively simple cryptographic puzzle that could be solved on your home computer. But now, because of the exponential uh, curve of the cryptographic puzzles getting more and more difficult, it now requires incredible amounts of resources to mine that new Bitcoin, and it will only increase from here, so that if things were projected a few years out in the future, they say, you know, by if such and such a date, you know, 10% of the world's energy supply will be going to mining Bitcoin. I, I think there may be some other things that intervene between here and there, but you get the idea. This is an energy-based currency in a sense, because it is energy that is being used to power the computers that are doing the cryptographic puzzles, and it requires more and more of that energy. I think that's an interesting tie-in with the, that idea of an energy script, and it does raise the question of whether some sort of blockchain currency, Bitcoin, or some variant thereof, perhaps a Fed coin, might be the the currency ideal of the technocrats. What's your thoughts on that? It could be. The the whole blockchain technology is changing the world, not just in cryptocurrency. It's changing the world in lots of different areas. So we need to remember that 
that that applying blockchain to cryptocurrency that's just one little part of the whole of the whole thing that's going on around the world right now and we could probably sum it up in in the in the term fintech f i n t e c h which is used by the global elite now to describe the whole area of of uh, global finance fintech the, the application of advanced technology to finance and certainly bitcoin or cryptocurrencies are part of that in my opinion <clears throat> the only i it is interesting by the way that <laughs> the the total power required right now for uh, this year's Bitcoin mining operation and other uh, crypto mining car operations, I read somewhere that is that like equals half the power that's consumed by all of Ireland. <laughs> it's like this is out of control. It can't keep up, or it will consume all the energy in the world. They'll need nuclear reactors pretty soon to you know hook into their computers to run them. But uh, but that aside, cryptocurrency can be used with any kind of touchstone, James. I think this is the this is the way to look at it. We'll talk about Earth dollar in just a minute. Whatever the touchstone is, the seed, if you will, right now the seed is an algorithm, right? Like for Bitcoin. Um, whatever the seed is, as long as it can be publicly documented that that it has a limit of some kind, like the amount of of energy reserves in the world, for instance, let's say the amount of oil plus gas and coal or whatever, that's a well-known statistic that's published routinely by the oil industry, the energy industry. How many resources uh, are there available to us like in the next five years? All those numbers are there. You could take a, a touchstone like that and base the amount of cryptocurrency on that touchstone. Everybody say, yep, I see that over there. That number is the fact. It can't be juggled. It can't be faked or whatever. It's the real deal. So somewhere along the way, I think there's going to be a touchstone, an e some kind of an economic touchstone that's suggested to fund or to limit the amount of, of blockchain currency that can be created. And it probably is not going to be the public that does this. It's probably going to be a central bank. Is pro or maybe a group of central banks, or maybe the Bank for International Settlements, or maybe J.P. Morgan Chase themselves. But somebody's going to do it, and the only way they can sell it to the people is to say it's backed by some touchstone resource that everybody independently can look at and verify it's there. It could even be gold, right? It could even be precious metals, for that matter. I don't know what it's going to be, but energy energy would be an awful easy thing just to factor in. So, yep, it's going to be how many millions of barrels of oil we got all around the world, uh, you know, and in, in, in proven reserves. That's going to be the number divided by population. And there you go. Right. And you raise the specter of the Earth dollar, which is something that I hadn't heard of until I read this book. So tell people about this. Well, I will. And here again, this this kind of plays off the touchstone idea again. Sustainable development needs to be financed. AOC, with a green, new green, a green New Deal, brought up the idea. It's going to cost something like, what, $30 trillion, I think she said, to you know do all the stuff she wanted to do. That's probably generally true. On a global basis, there have been estimates ranging up to $100 trillion, $150 trillion to achieve sustainable development throughout the world. There's not that, that much money doesn't exist. <clears throat> Wouldn't you suspect, though, back when the Federal Reserve was created uh, in the early 1900s, that even the Rockefeller family knew that there would be some time in the future where that whole scheme would run out of juice when you've milked it as much as you could possibly milk it and the currency itself serves no further purpose for them to amass wealth? They're going to abandon it for something else, right? Well, this seems to be what they're abandoning it for right now. So <clears throat> how are they going to finance sustainable development? The United Nations got everybody committed to it, but 197 nations around the world committed to doing it. How are they going to tell these poor countries, most of them are poor countries, by the way, how they're going to finance it? Well, here's the way to, this is the easy way to do it. The earth dollar may not fly, but the idea is brilliant. It's evil, <laughs> but it's brilliant. You merely take all of the World Heritage Zones, for instance, that's what Earth Dollar is going to do. 
You take all the word World Heritage Zones, I forget how many hundreds of millions of acres there are, rich with resources, timber, like the rainforest down in you know, South America, rich with resources, gold, silver, oil, timber, water, you name it. And nations around the world have been had areas declared as heritage zones by the United Nations take those assets and pledge them to monetize them with cryptocurrency. And all of a sudden, it's done. Now, you, if let's say that you own an earth dollar and some the, 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 the rainforest is pledged against it. Say they valued it at you know three trillion dollars, and you have an earth coin in your electronic wallet or even one physically in your hand, <clears throat> you'll never see even one pine needle or one leaf from the rainforest, right? You're not going to go down there and stake a claim. I don't care how many you have. So on one hand, it's a completely mythical formulation because nobody's ever going to go claim it. But on the other hand, people say, oh, it's backed by those resources. Those are resources that are owned by the world resources. Why not? Pledge them to the currency. It backs the currency. You can expand the currency as much as you want. Every time you bring in some new global resource, like the ones taken away from you and me as we go along and convert it into heritage zones or national parks or, you know, whatever other kind of cockeyed scheme the government could come up with to get more land out of our country, that land can be pledged to something like the earth dollar and boom, presto, money to spend on sustainable development. That's really what caught my attention to put to put that in the book and describe it. Earth dollar itself may not fly. It, it, it looks a little bit weird to me, but so did Bitcoin when it first started. <laughs> you know, so it could fly. If it doesn't, though, the idea has already been floated and a lot of people are looking at it. They're aware of the possibilities that this could be the kind of mechanism that could finance all of sustainable development, it would leave our monetary system behind, James. This is an important thing. It would leave our, mon our price-based monetary system in the dust. There, they, it would just go poof and disappear over a period of time. There would be no need for it. Once sustainable development is implemented, something like the Earth dollar could be the global currency. Dollars, forget it. Yuan, forget it. The yen, forget it. Don't need them. Maybe you could convert them to a few Earth. Oh, just we'll give you some tokens. Exactly. You know, just for your trouble. Tokens and tokenization is one of the key words that people should be looking at in this uh, uh, term that you do yes. discuss in the book. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, we do know the U.S. dollar's position as world reserve currency is being undermined. But I've never thought it's going to be replaced by the yuan or something like that. Maybe a basket. No, no. Maybe something like the Earth dollar, and not necessarily the Earth dollar, as you say, but something like that. And just reading in more detail from the book. You're right. In 2015, another nonprofit organization sprang up in California called the Earth Dollar Alliance, which attends, uh, intends to soon launch the Earth Dollar as an asset-backed global cryptocurrency. According to its website, Earth Dollar is different than most fiat currencies because it is backed by natural capital assets within our world heritage sanctuaries. The Earth Dollar's value is secured against natural capital assets, which will be placed in a global commons, held in a trust, and safeguarded indefinitely for the benefit of the planet Earth and all the life it supports. And you note, although ED, the Earth Dollar, claims that it is asset-backed, no holder of the currency will ever see any of those assets. The ED website pledges total support for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the World Bank's Natural Capital Accounting System, and World Basic Income, which is similar to Universal Basic Income, but global in application. Actually, something I'd never even heard of until that. But, and then you, you uh, point out that furthermore, the Earth Dollar claims that it has coded the following laws directly into its blockchain. The Universal Declaration of Rights of Mother Earth, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Constitution of Mother Earth, uh, a document that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, just incredible <laughs> stuff. And as you say, you this particular formulation of it may not be the one that catches on, but something like this is very much what the global planners have in mind. And this raises 
in my mind, um, one of the core issues here that some people might have as a roadblock towards understanding this information, which is, oh, this just sounds like, you know, Luddite, Ludditism and you're just afraid of technology. Um, whereas I think the point to be made, and don't let me put words in your mouth, you can explain this in your own words, but I would say that the point to be made is that, of course, like any technology, it is a double-edged sword and it can be wielded for good or for evil purposes. And as you say, the Earth Dollar idea is ingenious. It's evil, but it's ingenious. Um, can this technology be used for good? And I, I put this in the context of cryptocurrency because it's something that I've talked about on my podcast before. I had an episode called The Bitcoin PSYOP, where I talked about how there's Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as a general idea and what it could be and as a way of circumventing the fiat system that's been created around us to keep us in this monetary paradigm. But then, of course, there's also this could also turn into the absolute dream of the technocrats, the completely controlled system where they see absolutely everything that's going on, because instead of a decentralized open blockchain, it will be a controlled central bank blockchain administered by the bankers themselves. What could be better? Talk about the dual nature of this. The good evil technology is not necessarily the enemy itself. It's the way that it is wielded. That's exactly right. It's just like money. You know, the Bible says, for instance, that money, the love of money is not, okay, money is not the evil. The love of money is what is evil and, and, and used in the wrong way. Money can be used, be used for great good. It can be used for great evil. We're using a technology right now. I love this stuff. You know, we're on, we're on video. We're, we're continents away, halfway around the world. And we're talking to each other just like you're in the next room. That's amazing. How many people have had tremendous benefit from this kind of technology? When technology serves me, now this video is serving us right now. I'm getting something and you're getting something. This is for us. You're not manipulating me and I'm not manipulating you. I'm not trying to get something out of you. But when the same technology is used like in China for facial recognition to collar people on the street that they think are misbehaving, same technology, uh, artificial intelligence wrapped into it and everything, all of a sudden it becomes purely evil. And I usually say when I'm speaking, just so I don't offend engineers and scientists in the audience, I love technology. I think it's great. I grew up with technology. I, I've been steeped in it all my life. You name it. I did a lot of stuff over all my professional career. I love this stuff. But what I don't love is when people turn around and try and use it to manipulate me to do something they want me to do. Now, they could have done that before with just a gun, you know, say, go there, whatever, put a gun on my head. But today, it's, the manipulation is different. They're using propaganda. <clears throat> They're using um, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms to, to, to box you into situations you can't get out of, like in China with social uh, credit scoring system and so on. You can't escape that stuff. We could escape uh, a communist dictatorship. You know, you, you can get the leader and get him, right? <laughs> you can escape a fascist dictatorship. We've done that before. We did it in World War II. We conquered all kinds of bad people back then. When you got people at the helm, it's pretty easy to mount a revolution and get them one way or another. With a scientific dictatorship like what we're looking at now, you can't get loose from it. That's the problem. Once it's in place, you can't break free. Who do you go to? Who do you go complain to? Who do you go, oh, you say, I got to get my hand around that guy's throat. Whose throat? <laughs> There's some programmer buried back in a blockhouse somewhere that you'll never know his name in 10,000 years. And he won't know yours either. He's just doing his thing. So technology has a penchant to be used for tremendous evil. I would back up, by the way, to the 30s. You mentioned a couple of things about where did they get all these ideas? Technocracy was housed at Hamilton Hall. The, in, a, in the basement there. It's the only building they had at the time, but it was a large full footprint basement, pretty big. They had half of it given to them for their project. The other half of it was occupied by the people building the first Hollerith computer, tabulator. That was Hamilton Hall. They rubbed shoulders with these brainiacs that we're building the Hollerith computer. And I don't think for a minute after reading something about these guys were geniuses. They were visionaries. They saw where the thing was going. And this is where they built their first machine. 
they rub shoulders with the technocrats over on the other side of the building. I am certain of it. How could you not? You got to get hungry, go to the cafeteria for a meal, for Pete's sake. You're going to rub shoulders with them. They picked up all kinds of stuff that they applied to technocracy. Say, so, well, maybe we can't do it today, but it's coming because our buddies down there are building it right now. And it'll just be a maybe five or 10 years down the road, we're going to have a lot of stuff. And they did. Now, 50 years down the road, 60 years down the road, it's just gone exponential. I think they saw that. Yeah. Um, Aldous Huxley was obviously swimming around in the scientific stew of the day, part of the famed uh, Huxley eugenicist family. But was he indirectly involved with technocracy that you know of? He wasn't directly involved with it, but he understood it. I believe he got inspiration from it to write Brave New World. You know, you go back. I've, I've read it a couple of times since on the last few years. I just have to keep going back and look at it because it's just amazing how how closely he picked he picked it. Well, I'll tell you how it got how he got cross pollinated. The president of Columbia, his name was Nicholas Murray Butler. They called him Miraculous Nicholas or something like that. But he, he was like a, a hobnobber, a globetrotter, a name dropper. And he loved to, to be part of the upper echelon of wherever it was. He spent about half his time in Europe hobnobbing with the people in Europe. One of his best buds in Europe was Benito Mussolini, by the way, which well, that didn't turn out too well for him. But he made the rounds in Europe. And when technocracy came to Colombia, it was the, the newest, the latest and greatest stuff that ever had happened. So he thought. So he spent the better part of a year telling everybody in Europe how wonderful technocracy was going to be until they discovered that one of the promoters of technocracy that was down in that basement was a complete fraud and didn't even have an engineering degree at all. He just conned them. And when he found out that, he drop kicked technocracy out so, so fast and so hard, their heads must have been spinning for six months. Uh, Randolph Hearst did the same thing, by the way, the guy that controlled all the newspapers over here. He realized that he'd been played across the country for stories and journalists and stuff that were that were sucking up to the technocrats. He said, man, you are out, you're so out of here. Don't you ever write about technocracy again or you're fired. And he put that memo out to all the newspapers. You never saw another story on technocracy after that. So. You know, the intelligentsia dropped it like a hot potato after a while, but it continued on anyway. And in the, in the, in the corporation membership uh, corporation called Technocracy Incorporated. Yes. All right. Well, more details on that story from uh, Why Big Oil Conquered the World, obviously also in your previous book, um, which we have talked about before on the podcast. We'll direct people once again to Technocracy, The Hard Road to World Order, which um, contains a lot of the details and names and dates and figures and facts and books and names and all sorts of things um, that people can get into the nitty gritty. Obviously, we're just skimming the surface in a conversation like this, but I hope it at least whets the viewer's appetite to Get, delve more in deeply into this because there's so much to, to uncover here. Such an important part of history and now current ongoing um, current events that uh, most people don't even really realize is happening. So I'm my hats off to you as always for digging all of this up. Um, Patrick, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave, leave the viewers with today? You know, I don't really think so. This is uh, this entire topic subject area is becoming more and more discussed in America. Finally. More journalists are writing about it than ever before. I'm really pleased on that. I don't know how much credit I can take for raising the bar in the journalistic world and some of the academic world, but you see the, you see the term thrown around now in, in, by responsible people in the right context, and I'm really glad to see the discussion starting. It's, it's, it gives me a little bit of hope that America will have another chance to reject technocracy. And I hope they do, because if they don't, we'll, we'll never break the shackles of scientific dictatorship. My exactly. Opinion. Well, this is the game for all the marbles. All right, let's direct people once again to technocracy.news. Patrick Wood, thank you very much for your time today. You're entirely welcome, James. Thank you. Available now from CorbettReport.com. Oil. The 19th century was transformed by it. The 20th century was shaped by it, and the 21st century is moving beyond it. 
But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power in a post-carbon world? Heirs to an oil fortune join the divestment drive. There is a price to carbon in their future. The negative impact of population growth. That is important not only for the planet, it is important for the business. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. How and why Big Oil conquered the world. Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at corbettreport.com slash bigoil.